you can please take your seats, we'll get started. Thank you. Should I? It's very impressive. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight um, to our city council meeting this evening. We appreciate that you've taken time out of your day to join us and attend this meeting, uh, to participate and to see your local government at work. To start the meeting, we have laid out some guidelines for decorum and civility to make sure people feel comfortable and safe to participate. Please be respectful during other people's comments. Avoid cheering or jeering because it could cause someone to feel intimidated. Please also help take care of this historic meeting room by not standing on furniture or leaning against decorative pieces. If you have a sign, prop, or other piece of equipment, uh, like video equipment or other, please make sure that it does not cause disruption or block other people's views. Signs wider than your chair will be displayed in the hall. Also, items like sticks and dowels are not allowed. Please do not approach the dice. If you have something to pass out to the council, a staff member can assist you, and they're located on either side of the room, typically. And our staff is here to help you. If you need any assistance or have any questions, please raise your hand and a staff person will come to help you. Also, we recognize that two minutes of common time may not be long enough to get all your thoughts outlined tonight. Please visit our website or refer to the contact information sheets by the speaker's cards for information about other ways to share your comments with the council via email, phone, or mail. And to begin tonight, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We are proud tonight to host a fire department ceremony honoring heroes. I turn this uh, time now over to Chief, uh, Fire Chief Dale. Well, good evening and thank you. It's uh, not often we get to sit here uh, and recognize some of the citizens that assisted uh, in an emergency event prior to the arrival of the fire department. but. On September 18th, 2014, around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, three gentlemen were traveling in a vehicle eastbound on Indiana Avenue. They lost control of the vehicle, hit the bridge, overturned the vehicle into the bridge upside down. All three occupants were initially underwater. Prior to, while well, some people were calling 911, three individuals jumped into the water, got two of them out, could not get the third. They encouraged other people to risk themselves into the water. About 20 individuals were in the water and actually overturned the vehicle. I got there just as they were, our team is extricating the patient who was trapped inside. Three of the captains came up to me and said, Chief, without a doubt, those three individuals changed the outcome for this patient. The fact that those captains came to me and told me that was very, it told me a story because our guys typically don't do that. And so the three individuals that were there initially that really kind of drove this whole thing were Leo Montoya. Johnny Drawn and Andrew Adrian Lyon. We don't have the names of the other 15 or more individuals who jumped into that water, risked themselves to get this rescue started. The other piece of this, tonight we're honoring three individuals, at least one of them is here, but tomorrow afternoon, we're at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we have a plaque that's been mounted on the bridge that dedicates what the individuals did prior to the arrival of the fire department. This incident occurred at the Indiana Bridge over uh, Jordan River, which is 500 yards from Station 6. So our response time was not prolonged in any way, shape, or form. But tonight, the individuals will be given the, um, <coughs> excuse me, will be given, I gotta make, get, this, get this right, hang on. The Citizen Heroism Medal uh, presentation, which is our highest award that we give to civilians. And it says that in, in, to get this award, they have to have put themselves directly at risk in the service of others. And there's no doubt that these three individuals did just that. And then tomorrow when we, we have the uh, unveiling, if you will, of the plaque on the river, it's to really it is to the community because the community stepped up and impacted very positively before the fire department could arrive. 
So it's very proud for me to be able to stand here and tell you the three individuals, again, Leo Montoya, Johnny Drawn, and Adrian Lyon. Uh, and I know that uh, Johnny is here. Are there any other gentlemen here that were there that night? It's not. Johnny, why don't you come up? Is my voice not carrying? So, Johnny, this is the Citizen Heroism Medal from the Fire Department. Thank you very much for all that you did that night. You certainly changed the outcome. And then again tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, we'll be at the bridge uh, and we'll unveil the plaque. Thank you very much for your time today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Chief Brown. And thank you very much, Johnny. Thank you. It's hard to follow that up, but we will now hold the public hearing portion of our meeting. We have a few, opportun we have a few opportunities for public comment tonight, and we'll call people based on the comment cards that have been turned in. Please note that if you've already spoken at a public hearing on a specific topic, you, you may not speak again during the hearing, even a continued hearing, but you may speak during the general comment period. I will call people two at a time. The first person come forward to the microphone and the second person, please be ready to follow. Comment time is limited to two minutes per person. You'll hear a little, uh, little buzzer. And you cannot combine time with another speaker. As a reminder, please help create a civil and respectful meeting by being respectful during other people's comments, no loud noises or disruptions. Please do not block other people's views with signs or other items and allow council staff to help pass out any handouts you may have. The Get there. Our first public hearing is the, par the partial vacation of West Capitol Street. And the cards I have so far, we'll start with George Chapman, followed by Mr. Brandon. I can't see your first name, I'm sorry. Hmm? Mitcha, Brandon, excellent. First? Yes, George, you're first. George, you're first. You first, and then uh, Mr. Bra Ms. Brandon. Okay, uh, I'm against this. Uh, this is an area that's right next to Warm Springs Park, and there's a potential for having a pedestrian path to encourage use of Warm Springs Park and encourage more people to use it. The more people to use it, the less homeless will be camping out there. There's also a very good chance in the future for putting a bike path through there because it's a lot safer, a lot easier than Victory Road. The other issue why you shouldn't approve this is because it's on a slope. It's right next to Victory Road, and if you build up on that slope where they're trying to, you actually could have, make Victory Road more unstable. I don't think city councils in Utah have a good history of approving projects on slopes. That's a good reason not to approve this one. It's on a slope, it could destabilize it. It's not in a stable area, I think. So please don't approve it. Thanks for listening. Thank you. After uh, Ms. Brandon will be Karen Brizendine, I believe. Uh, I live at 113 West Clinton Avenue, Minta Brandon here. And I've lived there 42 years. And never once, every time, the only time was Ted Wilson, mayor. He came up and he insisted on West Capitol having sidewalks and curb and gutter, which that sounds perfect in a perfect world. So they did. They did one block of West Capitol and all the way down where other people live. There is no curb and gutters. There's nothing. It very seldom gets paved. So now we hear, you want to close off that, some of that street. For what reason is that? To accommodate somebody new in the group? We're an old group, and we plan on being there for a long time. And also, I can't understand why... I understand Stan went up yesterday and seen the area, in which I truly commend you, because very few times do we ever get anybody... Before you ever make a decision, you should go up yourself and see it, because it's pristine in its way, but yet in another way, it's very dangerous. There's no way of two people traveling on the road at one time. Wall Street is one block down, and I live between Clinton. 
So anybody that's coming up Ball Street, they have to either pull over and let people go down or vice versa. Coming up Clinton, the garbage truck, he has no way of getting back out of going down West Capitol. There's no way. So I don't see how you can even think about closing off a road that's been there for longer than I have, and I've been there, like I say, 42 years, and I would really appreciate that you'd consider it, really consider how it affects other people and what it does for the area. Because you're in here, you've got also this plan that's going to have seven twin homes, so that's 14 units. That's 28 cars. Nobody goes without two cars. Okay, where are you going to, even in widening, whatever you want to do, where are you going to put all these? We can't. We can't facilitate any more. There's just no way that we can. Time. So I, I appreciate you listening to me, and I do again, Stan. I would salute you if my arm wasn't so sore from being on the phone all day. <laughs> so I'll see you at Community Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen Brizendine and then Vicki uh, Picadas. Thank you for hearing me. I'm Karen Brizendine, and I live at 669 Northwest Capitol Street. I am at the beginning of the dead end. Um, apparently, we're all a little bit confused as to what's actually happening here. Um, I take it they want to take a section to the east and make it a turnaround for the new project that they want to put up uh, seven townhomes again. I say 14 cars because we all want to curb our carbon footprint, right? So we'll only have one car each. This area that they're talking about, first of all, the big extensive equipment that needs to be used to do this will not fit on West Capitol without completely and totally blocking access to the homes, which means they will completely and totally block access to first responders. If there's a fire, if there's somebody having a heart attack, they are out of luck. They are going to have to hoof it out and bring hoses from whoever has one by their house. Because this project is on a very narrow road. I do actually have a picture I can pass around. Mm, go right here, the staff. Yeah. To a staff separate. This is our road, and it is very narrow. It does allow two cars to pass. One has to kind of be off the road, the actual paved part of it. Um, we have approximately 13 vehicles on our road at this time. Those 13 vehicles are fine. They get to and from the houses. But you bring in one big excavator and it's, it's over. We're not getting to our houses. We're not getting to our work. We're not getting help from the fire department if there's an emergency. Also, Clinton coming up to West Capitol, there's two ways into our dead end, but only one way out. And Clinton is narrow Time. and people, oh, people have to park. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Rizendine. Uh, Vicki Gekadas. Jakadas and uh, after, um, afterwards Bruce Baird. Excuse me. I happen to own the two houses and the property and I'm going to cry. I woke up this morning, I have thought, we sat the city planning when they tried to build this big cement thing. When I came home from teaching, he had taken the hill, put it on my property. I had to get Polly, the only person who would come and help us. I was late to work, my husband was late to work. Back then, I was younger. Hey, I'm old now. I, the stress back then, all they did was take my teaching time away and get substitutes. Now, I have, we have a very ill daughter. She has to work. We watch her children. I have to pick them up every day. I've got pictures for you guys. This is from the last time they did this. We could not get in and out. I couldn't even get to my fire hydrant. The man then, I guess, I don't know what happened to him now that he filed bankruptcy and didn't finish the, we live by the turnaround. I finally feel happy to live in a place in Utah where I feel okay. It's eclectic. I fit in in Salt Lake. The other places I've lived in in my life in Utah, I didn't fit in. And I just beg of you, don't do this to me again. I woke up this morning, I thought, do I need to put a second mortgage on my home to get an attorney so I can get in and out of my house at will? Because the last time they did construction, I couldn't. I would run out and see and they'd block, they had seven cement trucks that blocked me. I please beg of you, don't let them ruin West Capitol. We're environmentalists. I'm known as the deer lady. I feed everything the deer. We just take care of everything. 
people keep trying to buy our property and homes, I don't let them do it because I want, I want Salt Lake kids to have a place to see a lizard or a hawk. We have 40 baby quail now. I had a deer look in the window at me today while he was eating my petunias I planted while I was drinking my coffee. And I think he was telling me, you guys, please don't let him do this to West Capitol. It's a quaint little neighborhood and we love it. And we all try so hard to keep it that way. And I don't know what to do if you do that again, if you let this guy, all this construction and the dust. My husband's 90 years old this year. Time. And he has heart problems. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Bruce Baird, and following Mr. Baird, Sean Nevis. Mr. Johnson, Mayor, member of the council. Uh, my name is Bruce Baird. I'm one of the developers of this project. There seems to be some confusion here because while we're actually closing a part of West Capitol, we're actually making it bigger. We're closing it so we can expand it. I know that's a paradox, but we talked about it in the work session two weeks ago. Uh, we're actually going to make it bigger. We will assure you that we trust your city staff to make sure that we do not block anybody's traffic while we're constructing it. We're working with the city to make sure there is a sidewalk and a curb and gutter on one side of it. This project will actually make the area better. The Planning Commission was very clear, despite hearing all of these complaints, that the project, and the staff was very clear, this project complies in all ways with all aspects of the subdivision law. The Planning Commission tied the two together just to make sure that we treated West Capitol correctly. We assure you we're going to treat West Capitol correctly. The, plan, the staff will determine what the sale price is. We're trying to work with the city's real property department already to make sure that the money that we pay for the closed portion of the street actually goes into making the area better. As to traffic, I've done a traffic count of this uh, issue. Standard traffic numbers, 44, 14 units, 11 trips a day, 154 cars, assume half of them PM peak each direction, assume 60% of them go one way, assume they all use West Capitol. That means one new car every 2.7 minutes during Prussia, rush hour. Those are simple math statistics that any traffic engineer would do. Tra city's transportation department and no other city department had any concerns with closing West Capitol. This is, uh, it's zoned for this. It's an appropriate development. The Planning Commission recommended it. Staff recommended it. We would appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sean Nevis next. And Mr. Nevis is the last card I have currently. If there's anybody else who'd like to speak, please see the staff right now. Um, council, uh, Mayor, uh, and staff, uh, thank you so much for hearing us out. I'm one of the developers of the project as well. Um, very, very proud to be a developer of this project. Um, I am a, a West Salt Lake uh, devotee. I live in Fair Park. I've lived in West Capitol. I helped open up Ann's Restaurant, Center Street Market. I have a vested interest in this project being beautiful and being done correctly. Um, this strip of land, uh, if we're looking for vacation here, really allows us to Im improve uh, West Capitol. Um, we'll be putting sewer in and utilities uh, and widening it. It'll be probably the best stretch of road uh, once that's done on West Capitol. We know how narrow those streets are. It'll actually be one of the better stretches, uh, fully compliant for fire access. Um, just wanted to, to toss my hat in the ring and say, you know, we, we really hope to, to have this uh, approved so that we can improve that neighborhood and add value to our neighbors' properties. All right, thank you. Thank you. We have another card, Mr. Mike Bennett. Yes, I um, live at 681 uh, West Capitol, so it's directly across the street. The, the main concern I have is in this whole process, if it does get approved, how can we be assured of any property damage that could occur? Um, my water main bus, my driveway starts breaking up. Uh, what kind of assurances can we have to, you know, to bond or whatever that would be needed to secure our own properties? Um, I'm not against development, but I want development that is proper and appropriate for the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> 14 units is actually three or four times denser than what the property is right now. Um, that is my main concern, and that's what I'd hope you would consider in your deliberations on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Just have a card after you speak, come and fill a card out and we'll help you do it. You did? Uh, 
Hi, my name's Clarence E. Erickson. I live in Kenny Gorley Platt. You have these Rose Park street lights that's in my area. Um, I think, are you speaking to the West Capitol street closure or something different? Oh, the street lights of Rose Park. Street lights. That'll be our next one coming up. So. Oh, okay. It's all right. Cool. We'll call you up in a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to the West Capitol uh, street closure? Mr. Chair, um, I'd move that we close this um, public hearing and defer action to our July 12th meeting. Second. We have a, uh, it's been moved by Council Member Penfold, Penfold and seconded by Council Member Rogers. Is there any discussion? If not, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. On to Mr. Chair, yes. if I may, uh, just a personal privilege. Uh, I know that the, a lot of the neighbors have been concerned and i um, wondering if we could ask the, our staff, Brian, if you could make sure to collect their contact information so that we can have some follow-up with them. Uh, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, points of privilege? No? Okay. And next, we'll be talking about items B2 through B4 are regarding a new lighting fee. As we've listened to residents, we've noticed that there is some confusion on which, uh, quote, enhanced lights, unquote, the changes apply to. Please be aware the fees and changes we are discussing will affect a very specific group of property owners. If you live in a neighborhood with only one mid-block light on a wooden pole, these changes won't affect you. The base lighting fee on your utility bills, about $3.73 for homes, will continue and helps fund these lights citywide. If you live in a neighborhood with several decorative lights on your street, but, but they are connected to a nearby house and the neighbors take care of repairs, those are not included in the proposed fee either. These are called private lights. However, if you have decorative lights, the city comes to perform repairs, and you have received an annual assessment as a bill, these changes are specifically called special assessment areas, then these changes will affect you. These changes mean your annual bill will go away, and instead a fee will be added to your monthly utility bill. Some businesses will also be affected by the change for their decorative lights. We are considering these changes to make sure that the decorative lights are properly and regularly, regularly maintained and that they are upgraded for energy efficiency and to make sure that costs are paid for. With that said, we'll begin the public hearing. I have three cards so far. The first is Craig Carter. Following Mr. Carter, we'll hear from George Chapman. I'll see Mr. Carter here. Yeah, he's right. going to need the microphone. Okay. Thank you, George. My name is My name is Craig Carter. I do not live in Sugar House. I live in District 6, but my wife has her real estate office in Sugar House. Sugar House traffic is absolutely awful. If you want to approve housing along the tracks line, all it's going to do is increase the traffic. It's the same thing when they proposed the development Mr. where the... Uh, I believe, Mr. Carter, we're talking about the lighting right now, the lighting fair. Are you speaking to the streetcar rezoning? Right now, the public hearing is on lights. On lights? This is the lighting? Oh, this is the lighting? Yes. Excuse me. I speak. Okay, speak that. We changed that. Okay. The lighting in our area, which is above Foothill Village and above Foothill Village, is on the map for some kind of thing to happen, but it really, no one really knows about it in our neighborhood. We go to the neighborhood council meeting. It's not even discussed there. So it's a problem of getting the information out to the public. So we're, the concern of a number of people in our neighborhood is what's going to happen to the power rates. We didn't have an answer. No one seems to know really what is going to happen. Okay. There's some things on here, but it really doesn't explain what it is. It talks we, about tier one, two, tier two, tier three. Mm -hmm. We can have staff talk to you individually if you'd like some specific answers. Would that be helpful? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we can, we'll first check to be sure that uh, Mr. Carter is in a lighting district. He might be just on the edge. Okay. So, so Lahua or someone? Okay. Sure, that's fine. So, Mr. Carter, she'll meet you after this public hearing. Thank you very much. Mr. Chapman. Okay. Craig does live in one of the areas, I believe it's Tier 2, and uh, he's right. Nobody knows about it. I'm the only one who's trying to tell people this, and that's a good reason to continue the public hearing to the future when you can actually, after you can actually notify people that this is an issue that's going to possibly increase their fees. You're talking about doing a bond, and you're going to do a public hearing for that, but essentially, if you vote this, to accept this, you're essentially approving it as a done deal. The bond is just a, a rubber stamp, and that's wrong. So I'm asking you to hold off on voting on it, hold off on closing the public hearing. You need a lot more public comment before you move forward with this. It's actually a fee increase in many cases. So you should have a real public hearing. You should notify everybody who's involved, all the businesses in Sugar House, downtown. You're actually expanding an area and going to cost businesses in the uh, Rio Grande area a lot more. But nobody knows about it, and that's wrong. Please don't close the public hearing. Please continue it to maybe July after you notify everybody who could be involved in it. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Next, uh, Clarence Erickson. Hi again. Okay, I live in uh, Kenny Gorley Platte. Um, I have Rose Park surrounding me. Uh, and they stuck these street lights, and it has Rose Park uh, nameplate on it. And I'm not Rose Park. So, you know, if you could put a plain nameplate and just blank, that'd be fine. Um, we have a lot of problems around the area. Survey monuments on 10th North are completely wrong. They don't match up to 1955 Allen Broadbanks, Rose Park, or 1897 Kenny Gorley Platts survey marks. Uh, the city put a survey uh, mark on the sidewalk, and it doesn't match up to the survey monument on 10th North. Um, I'm mostly just upset that it's St. Rose Park on Kenny Gorley Platt because I'm not associated with that community, even though I ne live nearby. Um, uh, let's see. Um, now, Utah Machine Mill, they're a business in the residential zone, and there's a public alley in front of them, and they encroached on me on the, my side. And uh, our street is real small, and... Uh, on Sundays and Saturdays, uh, the Hispanic community uh, have a lot of people, and the streets get really blocked up, so, you know, one car can barely get through. It's a real small street. Uh, there's some way, you know, people can park on the east side, would be great, because that way uh, garbage trucks can get through. Um, now, who's in my district? Are you district? Right here. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. <laughs> Okay, um, I think that's about it. Time. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. That is the last card that I had. Anyone else like to speak to this issue? I'm uh, Jim Webster. You hear from me a lot. Um, I, I, you probably remember that movie with Paul Newman where he says the jailer says, we, what we have here is a failure to communicate. Um, I heard about the street lighting thing from George, and I still don't understand it. I'm a landscape architect, and I've designed a lot of urban environments. Uh, Black and McDonald visited my property about maybe two years ago, and they put in a piece of conduit, about 15 feet of conduit. My property is 65 feet wide, and I asked them, why didn't you put in the whole thing? And instead, they put in a box, which cost probably more than putting in the entire stretch of conduit. And they said, that's all, all we were told to do. 
Uh, I would feel a lot more comfortable about this, for instance, if I understood what happened to the $300,000 that I mentioned last time that was dedicated to Miller Park. It went to the university. Who made that decision and why? There's another $50,000 that UPNL gave to uh, then Chair Christensen. What happened to that money? There's $100,000 that uh, Roland Hall uh, dedicated as a requirement for their zone change for traffic mitigation on Sunnyside. You know, there's a lot of money missing, and I think we're talking about entirely new money for entirely different purposes, and I appreciate that, but I would really like to know where the money went. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to this issue of the lighting? Is uh, a look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that we close this public hearing and defer action to a future meeting. Second. We have a motion uh, by Councilmember Penfold, seconded by Councilmember Rogers. Is there any discussion? All those yeah, in favor? Mr. Chair. Oh. Uh, yes. Just for clarification, could I request from the administration that we uh, just get a simple update in some way, shape, or form for the council about the public outreach that we were told was being done in the uh, SAAs regarding lighting. We were told that all the residents were going to be uh, sent letters and notified of these proposals, and I would just like to get a follow-up on that. Yeah. Cindy, would you like to speak to that? If, if you would like to hear that now, the um, representative, uh, Tom Ward from Public Utilities, is here this evening, and, and Lehua Weaver from our office also could address that, but uh, mailings have gone out to each of these um, addresses. I don't know what... So uh, I'm told that two postcards have been sent and there have been community count to the community count. Two postcards have been sent and they've been to community councils and held open houses, the emails. Is there anything else we're missing on that? Tom can give a report on the um, community councils and the other organizations that he's visited to talk with their membership. Thank you, That Lehu. would be helpful. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, relative to the uh, notifications that went to the group of property owners who are in uh, currently the SAA areas, there are also about 50 properties that essentially have enhanced lighting that did not participate in the SAAs before that now fit this group. We sent mailings to those individuals as well. So there's been mailers and postcards that have gone to those individuals. We recognize that not everyone sees those and so unfortunately it sounds like some individuals didn't get that. We have reached out to each of the community councils that represent um, properties within um, the enhanced lighting areas. Some of those took us up to have us present to those community councils. Some did not. I'd be happy to meet individually with additional community councils as well as the individuals regarding that. Um, however, the outreach has um, the mailings have gone out and we've been, there has been an effort. So again, apologies to the individuals who weren't, uh, didn't get caught in that web of outreach that occurred. Mr. Chair, may, may I ask a question yes. of Tom? Um, do you know which community councils did not take you up on that offer? Sorry to put you on the spot like that. Or maybe tell us where you went. I'm envisioning an email that I know was sent out by our program manager. And oh, okay. I don't, don't know which ones did not. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Tom. Any other discussion? Thank you very much, Tom, from the council. So we have a motion to uh, continue to for action to a future date. All and in favor? I'm sorry, was the motion to continue the public hearing? The motion is to close the hearing and defer action to a future date. To close the hearing and defer action to a future date. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion passes. Item B5 is our next public hearing that has been continued from another date. Please make note that if you've commented on this topic before, your comments are on record. We invite all others who haven't had an opportunity to comment. This is Sugar House Streetcar Corridor Master Plan and Zoning Amendment. I only have one card so far, and that's from Craig Carter. If anyone else would like to speak to this, please uh, bring your card up. Mr. Carter, you're first. Yeah, we need the microphone again for Mr. Carter. Yeah. 
Thank you, Bridget. All right, now we get to talk about Sugar House. Yes. <laughs> the thing about Sugar House is it's a neighborhood community. And if we have high-rise buildings along the tracks line or any place else, it ruins the whole neighborhood. And it really brings in traffic, traffic, traffic. We keep saying, oh, we'll ride down the tracks line. If you sit at the, at the end of the tracks line and watch the few people that get on and off of the tracks line, it's a big joke. When I sat on the CAT committee for UTA, one of the plans was to use the tracks line to decrease the traffic on 2100 South. It certainly doesn't appear to be doing that very favorably. There's more traffic on Foothill, more traffic on 1100 East, there's more traffic on 2100 South. It's more traffic, more traffic, more traffic. And if you go to Sugar House, if you get on at the post office, and you drive down to the liquor store at the other end of the valley, it's slow traffic, slow traffic, slow traffic. If you go up 21st South now, and want to make a right-hand turn to go down Highland Drive, it's a long wait to make that right-hand turn. It's really a mess in what the city has allowed to happen in Sugar House. And it's going to be even worse if you allow the high-rises along the tracks line. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Next, uh, Jade DeYoung, and that's the last card I have. Please raise your hand if you'd like another card and I'll bring them to you. Thank you, Council. Um, my name is Jade DeYoung. I live right on the S-Line, uh, 2218 South, 600 East. I've been to a few meetings. I was assured there wouldn't be parking issues, there wouldn't be any construction issues. I've come home to my driveway torn up. I've had broken front windows. I've had three trees knocked down to the tune of about $1,000 by construction vehicles. And the only one I was ever reimbursed for, and that was after fighting with uh, Stacy and Whitbeck and UTA, was my one front window that got broke. And that was because I got all of them to come. I took off work and actually showed them with their construction running what it was doing to my house. Now, I have cracks in my foundation. My house was built in 1913, so there's expected to be some. But since the Sugar House line has went in, it's gotten worse. Now we're wanting to add a building next door to my house, which is literally right next door one foot from my driveway that will essentially block my whole valley view out and there's already parking problems I have to fight for parking in front of my own house now which in the 15 16 years I've lived at this address I've never had this issue I moved to Salt Lake I've started a business here I own Debris Automotive been open for 10 years just over here off of North Temple and this is about going to be the nail in the coffin for Salt Lake City for me and many others that I know of I would wish the council would look at the people that actually live on the S line and as much as I believe it was needed for the transportation it's affecting houses all over my neighbors have moved out my neighbors in the back have just put their house up for sale and now I am actively looking at it myself because this has created to where I no longer have a livable community myself. So I appreciate the council's time and for the people that have questions about construction you will not be compensated or reimbursed for any of that by any construction crews. Just fair warning for people on the road. So I thank you for your time and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe we have a few more cards coming forward. Uh, Mr. Staley, Jeff Staley. Yes, thanks for hearing from me. Um, we own a business that is located right on 22nd South and 7th East. Um, they have rezoned the whole area in there and we're only zoned at 35 feet. What we were hoping for is to zone it at 60 feet at least. The west side of 7th East is zoned at 100 feet already between 5th and 7th East for multi-housing. We were hoping to, to have it looked at to rezone for at least 60 feet. We're on 22nd South and 7th East on the east side of the road, right on the S line. And that's about it. Thank you, Mr. Staley. Thank you from here. I have no other cards. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to this issue? Mr. Seeing, Chair, seeing I, look for a motion. I move that we close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Adams, second by Councilmember Luke. Any discussion? All right, seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Motion passes. And Mr. Chair, I move that the City Council adopt the alternate ordinance amending the Sugar House Master Plan, amending the zoning ordinance to create the FBSC and FBSE form based special purpose corridor zoning districts, and amending the zoning map to establish FBSC and FBSE form based special purpose corridor zoning districts pursuant to petition numbers PLNPCM 2012-00576 and PLNPCM 2012-00577. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Adams, second by Council Member Luke. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, yes. uh, I appreciate uh, having all the great input we've had from the community about this and the responsiveness that the city attorney's office has had, planning has had, and you, my fellow colleagues, have had. I think that we have come up with a good compromise, and I appreciate everyone's help on that. So I'm pleased to support this motion. Any others? Seeing none, all those in fit? Actually, um, just to clarify for those of you who don't have the um, amendment in front of you, what, what this motion does is uh, changes the maximum building height in FBSC to 60 feet with an additional 15 feet in height for a total height of 75 feet, uh, which may be permitted for residential uses if a minimum of 10% of the units are affordable housing. So that's what that's what this alternate motion does. And I think we should also say it takes out of the policies uh, the right-hand travel lane that would be turned into um, parking and a bike lane on the west side of 7th East. It takes out the part that would connect Green Street through to Wilmington. And it also takes out the section um, of the southeast corner of 9th East and Sugarmont Drive and uh, keeps that open space um, and for discussion at a later time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Time to vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Chair, before we move on, I'd like to add some legislative intent pertaining to this issue. Go ahead. If I may, I make a motion that it is the City Council's intent that a petition be initiated to amend the form-based urban neighborhood two zone in the zoning ordinance so that interior side yard and rear yard setback requirements and upper level step back requirements are not dependent on adjacency to areas zoned as form-based urban neighborhood one zones. We have a motion by Councilmember Penfold. Any second? Second. Second by Council Member, oh, I forget, Mendenhall. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, I just, uh, as a, a point of explanation, this would provide the opportunity to uh, expand the uh, form-based zones in other parts of the city to be in compliance with the really uh, amazing work the planning department did in the Sugar House area. Any other discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. The next items, uh, B6 through B18, are associated with the implementation of the city's 2016-17 budget. Please refer to the agenda for a list of each of the items. We are going to handle all items as one public hearing. Currently, I have three uh, comment cards. We will begin with Mr. George Chapman, followed by Blake Perez. Okay, you're losing five to six cops in the last month. It's going to get worse. If you're not adding more cops, you're actually decreasing the number of cops on the beat. So I'm asking you to please add more cops. The best way to discourage crime is more visible police. Now down in the homeless area, the drug issue is getting even worse. You need more cops. Also, you need a place for the homeless to stay other than the sidewalk. We keep doing this again and again. And I'm going to keep bringing it to you because you keep ignoring it. And for the next eight years, four years, whatever you're here, you're going to still be faced with the homeless on the sidewalk. And that's on you. You can stop it right now by putting a, an inviting area for the homeless to stay where they can be fed by the charities 
without encroaching on regular businesses next door. Please add more police and an expansion area to uh, your budget. Also, the fees just don't make sense. A good landlord program actually is hurting and making homeless worse because it costs so much to check and discourage people who are out of jail from going into the housing we have, they end up on the street. Um, also, the Hive Pass, you still have to have a better 1,400 people on Hive. That's, a, that's a, an insult. You need more on that. Please increase the budget for more police. Please increase the budget for some kind of homeless expansion center now. Your storage is full, and it's going to take two years for any expansion outside of the area on the Homeless Commission uh, hearings. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Next, Mr. Perez, and following that, David Arnson. Mayor Rascusi, Mr. Leary, council members, thank you for having me. Uh, I am here to strongly urge the funding for the 6 North safety project at the intersection of 6 North and 800 West. For far too long, my neighbors in Fair Park and Rose Park um, have had to deal with dangerous drivers and way too uh, fast speeds along that corridor. And the time is now to fund that project and to slow down 6 North. Uh, three years ago, Rose Park Community Council adopted the intersection um, and the bridge at 6 North uh, for neighborhood cleanups. And during that time, we've seen continuous speeding. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, one of the police officers who helped us out a few years ago nearly got hit. We continue to see accidents. We continue to see both auto and pedestrian accidents. And a few lives have been lost along that corridor. Um, I'm here to kind of promote and, 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 and tell you how proud of I am of the Rose Park Community Council of this campaign that we started. Um, we do have a website, Slow Down 6 North, um, where you can go and check out the information. Um, I encourage you to also check out our online petition and see the comments that people have made. Uh, through that petition, we have 200 online uh, signatures. Uh, we have 200 here, and uh, the United States Postal Service has two addi 200 additional signatures for a total of 600 uh, signatures. Um, in the recent weeks, uh, I've seen um, great commitment from the administration and from the city council to fund this project. Um, it's encouraging to know that the leaders of the city uh, believe in safety projects, and uh, I look forward to having this, uh, this project funded. Thank you very much. Did you say the United States Postal Service has 200 signatures? Yeah, they're lost somewhere. They're lost somewhere. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Uh, David Arnson and then Annie Dayton. Hello, my, my name is David Arnson. I might not be in the right order. I wanted to speak on the Salt Palace and what a wonderful conference center that it is. Um, we'll be, are you speaking on the, the, the zoning, the zoning and for the, the height? And the height. We'll come to that uh, a little later on, actually. Okay, Should we hold I'll on for a second? Yes, yeah. thank you. I'll do the same one. Mr. Arnson, come on up, back up. Go ahead, make your comments now. I had to make sure about the order today, so. It's brief. Thank you, I, pre I apologize. Not at all. <clears throat> um, I, um, I just wanted to put in um, my two cents worth on the Salt Palace. I think it's a wonderful complex, serves the city well. It has great uh, visual uh, contact, contact and, and scale. Um, I. Um, I uh, know that there wants to be a hotel to facilitate the use of the um, conference center, convention center. And um, that, but I, th I think, uh, at least in my heart of hearts, that's a separate problem. Um, I, I know it wants to be close, say a thousand feet, but I think that the site itself is, um, in fact, I drove by it, I was on, on the south even, and I saw the, um, uh, eight, eight or ten uh, big buses loading after a conference was letting out. It's, the, the site is well utilized and maintained and it has a great visual um, appeal. In particular the, the entrance, um, often I'm coming down 100 south going west and I can see the, uh, the entrance um, um, steel and glass structure and it's, um, it's very remarkable. So I just wanted to put in a plug for the um, uh, Salt Palace and its use, and um, and uh, hope it continues in the same way. And and the hotel, I hope, can uh, find another site. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Annie Dayton followed by Brandon Dayton. Hi, thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm a Rose Park resident and I just wanted to voice my support for the Slow Down 6 North campaign. Um, every single day uh, that is my commute and there have been countless times where I've seen people sprinting across that intersection having to stop halfway in the middle because cars are racing by and not stopping for them, um, especially in the winter when it's really dark and people can't see them so well. So I strongly advocate advocate for those um, budget amend amendments for us to be able to put in the bulb outs and the flashing red lights so that that is a safer area for people and we don't have any more um, deaths or people scared to, to cross that. Thank you. Thank you. Brandon Dayton, and that's the last card I have. If anyone else would like to speak, please see a council of member staff. Okay. Um, so I had a chance to firsthand collect some of these uh, signatures for the petition, and um, I was amazed to see like how strong the support is from other people in the community and hear firsthand stories of near misses and not near misses. So I just want to uh, reiterate, reiterate my support for the uh, Slow Down 6 North campaign, and I hope it wasn't my petitions that were the Postal Service has, but. Either way, um, I hope you support it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have Fred Lorenz now. Mr. Lorenz? Oh. Come on up. Um, hi, I'm part of the Rio Grande uh, Homeless Coalition. Um, and uh, uh, my friends and I, were, we're actually homeless. Um, and we just heard today that uh, in your budget, you're um, one of the, the first guys that came up here was talking about uh, you guys are thinking about possibly relocating all the homeless somewhere or, or um, just we weren't really sure what was going on. Okay. Um, like are you guys going to keep the road home and everything where it is or, or are we going to be shipped off somewhere else? Um, we can have staff actually talk to you about specifics on what's going on in the process if you'd like. That'd uh, be helpful. Okay, yeah, yeah, that'd be helpful. Cool. We can do that. Well, the staff member... Um, Someone over here will raise your hand in a second and, and talk to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this, uh, this subject? Mr. Chair, I move that we close this public hearing and defer action to June 14th. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Penfold and seconded by Councilmember Kitchen. Any discussion? And Mr. Chair, I'd just like to mention to those uh, very dedicated Rose Park people that I do believe this afternoon we found some identified some uh, funding in the budget. So uh, I'm sure your representative will be in touch with you about uh, that opportunity. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Next item is B19, local building authority budget hearing. Do I have a motion to convene as a local building authority? Mr. Chair. <laughs> I move that we uh, recess as the city council and reconvene as the board of directors of the local building authority. Second. second. We have a motion by council member Adams and second by council member Rogers. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. City Council uh, will consider, let me just make sure here. Yeah, City Council will consider, uh, consider a motion. Oh, no, not it. Public comment, excuse me. I don't have any cards, I believe. No. I have no cards. Mr. No Chair. color cards, yes. Uh, I move that the, um, that we Adjourn as the Board of Directors of the Local Building Authority and reconvene as the City Council. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Luke and a second by Council Member Kitchen. Any discussion? Yeah, I just want to say I, I thoroughly enjoy uh, being a member of the Board of Directors of the Local Building Authority more so than I think a City Council member. So <laughs> thanks for that opportunity. It's now been noted. <laughs> Any other discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. I look for a motion to adjourn as the Board of Directors of the Local Building Authority. Wait. So moved. And reconvene as the City Council. And reconvene the City Council, excuse yep. me. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Rogers, second by Councilmember Mendenhall. 
All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes. We are now at item C, potential action items. Our first item is the Westminster College Master Plan and Zoning Map Amendment. I don't have any cards yet. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this? Excuse this me, it's not a public hearing. My, my bad. This public hearing? No, I don't no, think it's not. so. Excuse I, me, it's not a public hearing. Mr. Chair, I, I look for a motion. Like to to move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the zoning map pertaining to multiple parcels located between 1858 and 1888 South 1300 East to rezone those parcels from R15000 single family residential district to institutional district and amending the Sugar House master plan future land use map. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Adams, a second by Councilmember Rogers. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Penfold. Mr. Chair, I just want to um, uh, state that I, I will actually be opposing this motion, not because I have any issues with Westminster or their proposal there, uh, but because I have concerns about the institutional district and um, our need as a, a city to more clearly identify what is allowed and not allowed in that district. I think Westminster has been a great community partner and I actually like the direction they're going, um, but I do think we have some serious concerns about the institutional district. Any other discussion? Yes. Uh, Stan, as vice chair of the council, will you and the chair be bringing the institutional zone discussion to the council and work session? As soon as we get through the budget, yeah. I think that everything is We're available, almost there. right? <laughs> uh, I'd, like, I'd like to lobby for that as well. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. The motion passes. Our second potential action item, item C2, is regarding a historic landmark boundary adjustment on 11th Avenue. Mr. Oh. Chair, I move the council adopt an ordinance amending the zoning map pertaining to the property located at 381 East 11th Avenue to modify the boundaries of a landmark site. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Rogers, a second by Councilmember Kitchen. Any discussion on this item? Mr. Pinkett. Chair, uh, <laughs> uh, my uh, evening will be about symbolic uh, voting, I think. Um, I do have concerns, uh, not with this particular proposal, but with our inability under our current landmarks ordinance or our uh, landmark zoning ordinance uh, to control um, any building design um, to a project that's um, infill immediately adjacent to an existing landmark structure or a uh, landmarks uh, border. Um, I do think that's something we, we may need to address in the future as well. Uh, the city has a host of landmark sites. Um, that are unique to Salt Lake City for a lot of reasons. It could be the design, it could be the person who lived there, it could be the age. And um, I think as we see increasing density in the city, it's going to be critical for us to consider um, our ability to mitigate any adjacent property development or infill uh, so that it reduces the impact to those landmark sites. Thank you, Councilmember. Any other comments? I'll be voting against it for reason of precedence uh, in separating apart uh, to historic landmark sites um, for essentially for personal gain and I, I don't believe that this is a healthy precedence for us to set. Thank you. Other discussion? I'll take a point of privilege and I, I agree with Councilmember uh, Penfold actually on this one. Uh, for the same reasons, actually. And uh, I'd like to see us make sure that we're addressing um, future issues this way because I think there's a place for modifying these um, parcels in appropriate ways, but we don't have much of a say at that point once we allow it. Uh, I have concerns about that as well. So take a vote. Um, should we roll call this one? Or are we, yeah, we'll roll call this vote. Um, Councilman Adams? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. No. And I am a yes. 
So we have four S, yeses, and three noes, I believe. It passes. Item C3 is regarding the central, ni central ninth lofts partial alley vacation. I'll look for a motion. Mr. Chair. I move that the council adopt an ordinance vacating a portion of the air rights above an alley that transects property located at 1068 South Jefferson Street, subject to the administration and petitioner entering into a development agreement to be recorded against the property that requires that the pedestrian walkway to be mostly constructed of transparent building materials such as glass, and that the, peti the petitioner shall prepare the development agreement in a form that is satisfactory to the city attorney. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Kitchen, a second by Councilmember Mendenhall. Any discussion? I'd like to speak to that. Yes. Uh, traditionally, I would be against vacating alleyways. I think that we should be uh, preserving them as much as possible. Um, this case, I think, is a little bit different considering that uh, this alleyway happens to um, bisect at one single individual parcel um, in a neighborhood that desperately needs the investment. We're bringing residential to the ballpark neighborhood and I think that um, in order for this project to pencil out for the developer, um, it makes more sense for them to build one structure with um, a walkway across. So I am supported, supportive of this um, alley vacation. Council Member Mendenhall. I'm supportive of this one also. I was skeptical at first. I think this is a really interesting proposal to um, unite properties and do something new with uh, airways that we've never done before. I think it has the potential to be a draw to that neighborhood and uh, also potential to activate an alleyway and maybe encourage different kinds of activity and use uh, north of this what will be a bridge an air bridge essentially on that same alleyway. So this is a really interesting thing. If you don't know what we're talking about, there's a, an apartment complex that's going to be going in um, that, as Councilmember Kitchen mentioned, spans uh, an alleyway, crosses an alleyway, and they're going to be building a connector between the two buildings above the alleyway. Um, and it is, they're promising us it will be aesthetically pleasing and maybe even artful. So if you, uh, if you get the chance in a year or two, drive by Jefferson and check it out. It's nothing that's ever happened uh, in a residential alleyway before in Salt Lake City. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Sure. Any other discussion or comments? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It passes. Uh, next item, C4, is regarding building height in downtown secondary central business district zoning text amendment. I'll look for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to read this motion. I, it's got a couple of components I think are important that we read into the record. I move that the City Council adopt the ordinance amending sections 21A.30.045 of the Salt Lake City Code pertaining to building height in the D4 Downtown Secondary Central Business District pursuant to petition number PLNPCM 2015-00676 as described on the agenda with the following amendments. That paragraph 8A titled Additional Permitted Height Location include the words quote, but not more than 30, 375 feet in height, end quote, so that the paragraph reads, quote, additional height greater than 120 feet, but not more than 375 feet in height is permitted in the area bounded by the center lines of South Temple, West Temple, 200 South, 200 West Streets, end quote. That paragraph 8.A.1 titled conditional height include the words to a maximum height of 375 feet so the paragraph reads buildings may exceed the 120 foot height limitation to a maximum height of 375 feet provided they conform to the standards and procedures outlined in the conditional building and site design review process of chapter 21A.59 of this title and the following requirements. I also move that the City Council adopt the following legislative intents related to this motion. It is the City Council's intent that Salt Lake County officials 
thoroughly explore locating a convention center hotel near the southeast corner of the Salt Palace Convention Center, including the potential value to future commercial growth along 200 South Street versus locating hotel near to 100 South. And it is the city council intent that any hotel project avoid adversely affecting the Salt Lake Buddhist Temple at 211 West 100 South Street and the Japanese Church of Christ at 268 West 100 South Street, particularly access to each building and events held in them. Second. Second. We, <laughs> we have a motion I think by... we're going to be okay with this motion. <laughs> we have a council... Uh, a motion by council member uh, Penfold and a second by multiple council members, but we'll, we'll go with council member Mendenhall on this one. Uh, any discussion? Uh. Mr. Chair, I support this ordinance and I appreciate the work of the planning department in looking at options and also the participation of the downtown community in our public hearing process, in our comment process. Um, it was uh, uh, really helpful to incorporating those conditions that I mentioned in that motion and, and I look forward to moving uh, forward on a, a possibility of a convention hotel downtown. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Our last potential action item is C5 regarding budget, budget amendment number five. I look for a motion. Okay, I'll Mr. go for it. I, I move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the final budget of the Salt Lake City, including the employment staffing document for fiscal year 2015-16 as outlined in the transmittal for budget amendment number five, with the exception of item A12 relating uh, to Wing Point Golf Course, which, has been which was addressed on May 24th. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Rogers, a second by Councilmember Kitchen. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Uh, next, we are welcome. Uh, welcome the mayor tonight, Mayor Biskupski. Thank you for being here. And uh, it's time for any questions uh, to of the mayor from the city council. Are there any? Mayor, how's the budget going for you? Uh, I'm not sure it's in your hands, so I'm just waiting to see. <laughs> I think we were, I, some of us were remarking that this is one of the sm more smooth budget processes we've been through. So congratulations Thanks. to you, you and your staff on bringing us a budget that is uh, processing pretty smoothly. Great. Nice to hear that. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? I agree it's the smoothest budget I've been through. <laughs> It's a good way to start. I thought so. <laughs> All right. Uh, then uh, thank you again, Mayor. Thank you. We will now be taking general comments tonight and we'll call people based on the comment cards that have been turned in. Just like the public hearings, I will call people two at a time. The first person, please come forward to the microphone and the second person, please be ready to follow. Comment time is two minutes per person and you cannot combine time with another speaker. As a reminder, please help create a civil and respectful meeting. Be respectful during other people's comments, no loud noises or other disruptions. Do not block other people's views with signs or other items. And let council staff help pass out any handouts you may have. Now we begin tonight with uh, George Chapman. Following George Chapman, we'll have Jay Ingleby. Two issues, council and mayor. Um, mayor, during your press conference, uh, just before you were elected mayor, you uh, indicated that the 10-story building in Sugar House that was proposed is going to destroy the neighborhood. Your planning department is approving, as we speak, these projects that are going to be even worse. I urge you and the council, when these projects come up, do not approve them. Do not approve projects that destroy neighborhoods. This is a very special neighborhood in Salt Lake City. It deserves protection and I urge you to take a real close look at what it will do to the parking and traffic issues. Second, back to the budget. You have a chance right now to actually help the homeless issue. 
with more police officers and with some kind of expansion area to encourage the homeless off the sidewalk. They're on the sidewalk now. You could put a hundred million dollars worth of art down there it's not going to matter if you have a homeless guy drunk or shooting up on the sidewalk. That's the issue. So you're going to, you're going to put five million dollars into depot district and what's that going to do if you have homeless on the sidewalk? Your storage units are full for the homeless. You need more storage units. You need an inside area for the homeless. And when the people come and try and give them food and serve uh, the bur burrito brigade, they shouldn't be in a park that you're trying to convert for family use. They should be someplace inviting off the sidewalk, off the street, out of the parks where they can be helped with social services. As you know, Andrew, please consider that in your future deliberations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chapman. Uh, Mr. Ingleby, followed by Amir Cornell, I believe. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Jay Ingleby. I'm from Glendale Park community. I'm here tonight to ask the council and the mayor's support on two CIP grants that I turned in this year for to renovate two streets in our area that are in bad shape and they need to be done. So I'm here tonight to ask you to, as you proceed with the CIP process to take a look at helping us out with these streets. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about lately about infrastructure and street repairs that have not been done. I'm asking the council and mayor to start helping the people who elected you, especially those of us on the west side of Salt Lake City, who quite frankly say we don't feel like we're part of Salt Lake City. Okay? So the repairs of these streets will last for 30 to 40 years and are worthwhile projects and will help the appearance of our community. So mayor and council, please give us your support in these two ventures. We'll take one street if we can't get both. So thank you and please give us your support. Thank you, Mr. Ingleby. Uh, next, Amir Cornell, followed by Jacob Jensen. Good evening, City Council. My name is Amir Mohammed Sedegi Cornell. I live in this town for 35 years. Last Christmas, I was at the John Hansman Christmas party. John Hansman Jr. asked me, what is the best happened to you in 2015? I said, when Jackie Buzbuski become a mayor of Salt Lake City, I know the lady. I got discriminated by building enforcement. Oren Goff, Randy Isbell, Nora Shepard, Carol Jaint, they break into a school next door to me. They call to the mayor, Rolf Becker. They said, this lady, she is climbing from the fence. She's supposed to come and register at the desk. Since four years ago, if you want to go to a school district property, you got to register for front desk. They went after her. I invited to my property. You see, we the people in the state of Utah, we are friendly people. I asked her, what do you do? He said, Mayor Office, Rolf Becker, asked us to go around the block and find something. We called to Deputy Mayor or Chief of Staff. His name was Everett, David Everett. He said, we never asked them. Sorry, time. We like to be treated like a human being. 
just four, just two days ago. His name is Ahmed Sedegi, become a mayor of the London. He said, I asked the Lord not to see Trump to become a president of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Cornell. I would like you folks do something to treat the minority with respect. Is that too much to ask? I pay property tax. I pay property tax for two houses. Thank you, Mr. Cornell. I think time's up. Appreciate your time. Jacob Jensen, followed by Lauren Doxey. I want to thank the City Council for seeing me, um, but I find it disconcerting that the Community Controlled Police Review Board is still a yellow card issue. When I personally spoke to the District Attorney Sam Gill, he told me that there are four pending cases concerning police brutalities on the books before the one concerning Abdi Mohammed is addressed. Utah's ALCU has submitted an unanswered grandma request which is likely to be rejected. We've seen this song and dance before. We've seen it with Daniel Willard. We've seen it with Dylan Taylor and with many others. And now we're seeing it with Abdi Mohammed. We're going to get the evidence too late and there's going to be nothing that the community can do to respond to it or even to comment on it. When the shooting of Abdi Mohammed happened, Mayor Biskupski saw the footage before it was ever turned over to the Unified Police Department for an independent, though par um, thoroughly, partially, uh, thoroughly partial investigation. We need a police control, uh, excuse me, we need a community control police review board. It needs the power to delegate from the mayor to see footage and the power of subpoena. It needs the power to change police policy and he needs the power to recommend police discipline to the mayor and to the police chief. And lastly, it needs the power to deliberate responsibly with the, sta with the staff ethicist and uh, with the ability to craft police policy with them responsibly and uh, a lawyer as per the CRB. And those are my under two minute comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Please uh, remember to uh, refrain from clapping if possible. I appreciate it. Uh, Lauren Doxey and then Ken Pollard, please. Hi. Um, we are here representing the United, uh, United States National Committee for UN Women Utah Chapter. And what, um, in addition to raising funds for UN, uh, and UN Women initiatives abroad, we are also here tonight to advocate for women locally. Um, uh, as we know, the United States did not ratify the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, um, but we have a unique opportunity here in Salt Lake to implement a CEDAW ordinance. And what that entails is advocate, uh, allocating funding to implement those principles of equality. City, cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, and miami Daddy County in Florida have done this. And we need to get moving on implementing these, the CEDAW ordinance. We understand that you are exploring a resolution, and we would like to advocate for funding for the 2016-2017 fiscal year, and to use gender analysis budgeting in which uh, the city council will engage the gender differences um, between men and women and see where women or men need more or less funding in order to make our programs for women and children more effective and to institute more, more programs in order to help fix the problem of inequality in our community. Salt Lake City uh, does fare better than the rest of the state of Utah in gender equality, um, but as of 2012, 55% of women still don't have access to affordable child care. Most have difficulty gaining access to quality health care, and of the households headed by women, roughly 41% of them are in poverty. Um, but we can, we can fix this by allocating funding in order to um, implement those CEDAW principles to foster gender equality in our community and um, to help make uh, this society more friendly to women and to make them more friendly to working families. Um, thank you so much and please, considering, please consider using gender analysis budgeting in uh, your future budget. So I actually have business cards for you guys to get in touch with us, so that's okay. 
Thank you very much. Next, Ken Pollard, followed by Jenny Iwamoto. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ken Pollard. I'm an architect and urban planner. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, your changing of the words for the uh, height restriction and uh, zoning was, should be commendable. Uh, I think what uh, the, I'm an advisor to the JCPC group, and as I look at it, um, the scale of the convention center is quite large for any city, and uh, you should, as you move forward and plan for more growth, more hotels, which are coming, you should think about sustainability, not from the natural resource, but from a community standpoint, is that hit cities are repositories of memories and history. And so by keeping an eye on those communities that are impacted by large projects is very important. And that JCPC should have a seat at the table in terms of planning. Even though the hotel's on one far end, you still have impact with several blocks around from parking and infrastructure that affects the convention center. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Iwamoto, and then I'm going to mess a word up, but uh, Mr. Uno or Ray Rores? Uno? Go right ahead, okay. sorry. Good evening, Mayor Beskutsky and Deputy Mayor Leary and the City Council. I'm in here as a member of the Japanese Community Preservation Committee and Japanese Community, and I'm a past member of the Salt Lake pa uh, Convention Center and initial committee for the Convention Center, and I'm, I'm old. So it was in 2004 when we formed this committee, which consists of representatives of the Japanese Church of Christ, the Salt Lake Buddhist Temple, and the Japanese community. And, as a, and it was formed as a result of the most recent Salt Palace expansion, and its primary purpose is to protect and preserve the JCC, Salt Lake Buddhist Temple, and the Japanese community from negative impacts from the erection which happened in the 60s and expansion of the Salt Palace and any further expansions. Judge Uno will tell you and can tell you and my parents can tell you what it meant to have a place where all could gather as a community. They, they lived it. And I, I put a bunch of materials, but one is a, a diagram of all the businesses that were destroyed when they erected the Salt Palace. Um, in the, six, in the uh, late 60s. Um, and I know that also through stories from my parents and from living in the Bay Area where Japantown is still thriving like it is in many great cities in our nation. It was home to our uh, community. And although different religions, we are connected by blood and history. We have been together in this area for almost 100 years. We have appreciated the efforts of our great city, uh, capital city, and including the state legislature where Mayor Jackie Biskupski supported protections um, in legislation for the negative impacts uh, for future expansions. And we have continued to keep uh, the lines open with Salt Lake County through their actions, they have followed through with promises to alleviate the impacts to this area and there's a list of things that uh, have been accomplished. Although the convention hotel is proposed for the east side, um, we wanted to share our views and concerns and to let you know that although the once thriving Japan town is gone, our community exists and our home is on Time. First South Japan uh, Town Street. And although the JCC and Salt Lake Buddhist Temple are the last two the vestiges of what was once Japan town, we stand together and support each other. And our churches are not just places we go once a week, but they are living communities with members coming from all over the state. And I found, I'll hurry, I found a statement of our vision in my files today, and it says, our vision is simple, to restore what was lost, to not only protect the Japanese community, but to help with the economic development of the community at large. And we look forward to being active partners in the development and of this area. So thank you for all that you do and for your legislative intent today. Thank you very much. I believe Judge Uno. And then Stan Endo, please. Chairman, members of the council and mayor. Uh, you now I've been retired for 26 years and I shouldn't be here saying anything, but they asked me to kind of bring you up to date. And because I'm one of the few people that's left that originally, uh, you know, belonged to Japantown, I'm speaking in, the, in their behalf. 
And I think it's important for us, and particularly me, to perpetuate the culture and the community because it's been torn apart. We've been uprooted a number of times, and as you remember, during the wartime, I spent four years in a concentration camp in Wyoming. I come back here, and I try to find a house, and I've got to ask my neighbors if I can move in. And then I come to Japantown, and I thought this was a nice, viable community. And I find out that it's being torn apart little by little. And uh, it's unfortunate because our young people have really no place to go to. Anybody that used to come out from, uh, from out of state to come to uh, Japantown, they would say, where's, where's J-Town? Everybody knew where J-Town was on First South. At least now we have a Japantown street. Uh, the thing that I think b that bothers me is Anytime you mention about the expansion of the Salt Palace, it's going to negatively affect the Japanese community there. And every time you've expanded, that's exactly what happened. And we felt as a community that we should be unified in trying to let the people know that we would like to continue to stay there as long as we can, and we're hopefully for the rest of the lives of all of us that are here. And it's up to the uh, you know the community to do what they want to do, and I know if they're going to do it, they're going to do it, and there's nothing that we can do about it. But we want to be a voice in opposition. We want you to know that we really, really are uh, concerned about what's going to happen to the Japanese community, and that First South is very vital to the existence of the Japanese community at this time. The two churches are the only things that are left of the Japanese community. If you look at the map there, 90% of the community was destroyed, and we're being uprooted all the time. And uh, those of us that had to serve time, time. Uh, during the wartime in the camps, we were uprooted and we had to start all over again. And we don't want our children to have to go through the same thing that's happening right now. So I appreciate your ten, uh, allowing me to talk and hopefully that you will favor us with your whatever you happen to do. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Una. Next, Stan Endo, followed by Jonathan Harmon. Hi, I'm Stan Endo. I'm the president of the Salt Lake Buddhist Temple. Uh, I want to talk a little bit background of our temple, uh, concerns that we have with the impact of a large hotel and our ability to conduct temple business, and then want to convey our, that we do want to support the city economic growth and diversity goals. So um, background, if you didn't know this, uh, you know, we are a recognized church in the state of Utah. We were established as a temple, as a church religion back in 1912 in Utah. We've been on First South since uh, 1927 in two different locations. Currently, we're on first, the corner of First South and uh, 200 West. Uh, with the demise of J uh, Little Tokyo or Japantown with the construction of the Salt Palace, uh, the, the, as mentioned, the only two the remnants of Japantown is our church and the Japanese Christian Church. Um, we today we are a successful church. We have a diverse membership, and uh, we are a ga religious gathering place for people in northern Utah, not just Salt Lake. Um, <clears throat> well, the support of the growth of the city. Uh, we do have concerns with, with, as I said, with this building and other developments that may come around First South and our temple and the Japanese Christian Church. Primarily uh, impact to parking, uh, increased traffic, and our ability to have street closures for our events. And then the, our, the First South is constantly closed because of church, uh, excuse me, trucks and containers that are being stored on the, on the, on the street. Um, so we are very concerned about our ability to conduct services, uh, meditation, funerals, and our big three fundraisers, Obon, Bazaar, and Nihon Matsuri, which is where we get a lot of our revenue. So we are a thriving church, but we do have fiscal challenges any disruption of that will impact us financially, and we want to we want to partake and be a partner in the growth of the city, and we ask that we are become involved in the activities in any growth in our area. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Jonathan Harmon, followed by Chrisma Robb. Hi, my name is Jonathan Harmon. I'm the executive director of the Pioneer Park Coalition. And the Pioneer Park Coalition is a community group of concerned citizens um, living and working and owning businesses in downtown Salt Lake City. Um, we're looking to, we're a solution-oriented group that's looking for solutions to address the issues of crime and homelessness that are happening downtown. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for your work um, with the Collective Impact and Mayor Biskupski with the Mayor's Administration um, on the great work that you're doing. Um, and we want to touch on just one thing that pertains to this year's budget and next year's budget. Um, the great work of the Collective Impact Group, the Mayor's Commission, um, is going to take a few years to get down the road. And we feel like there's some things that we can be doing in the meantime um, to fix, this, fix what's going on downtown. Um, something that we're interested in is something called community policing. Um, as part of the community policing effort, we recommend the increased and consistent use of beat cops, police on foot and geographically localized to the Rio Grande neighborhood to help immediately address the unacceptable conditions found in our streets like prostitution, drug trafficking, um, open defecation in the streets, um, child abuse. These are things that we're actively documenting every day. Um, during the City Council work session on May 31st in 2016, the Council was advised about the potential reallocation of funds to the, administra the administration had earmarked for the social worker program in the area surrounding the road home. This money can be used to address other public safety issues in the neighborhood. Um, Councilman Kitchen proposed uh, to use the money for enhanced foot patrol in the area of highest drug trafficking on behalf of the property owners and business owners and the residents in that area. We stand in favor of that proposal. Um, we plan to push that and we plan to provide you with information to um, bolster that. Um, one other thing I'd like to um, say is a year ago um, this month, President Obama released a task force on 21st century policing. And inside of that task force, that, that, re that report, there's a number of recommendations. Um, we will be sending you those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, Chrisma Robb, followed by, I'm going to say, Clotilde Husha. And you're going to correct me, please. <laughs> Houchon. Merci. Hi, I'm Christina Robb, and I actually have a voice tonight to speak to you, but pardon me if it cuts out because I've been ill for a few months. Um, <clears throat> So we are, I'm the director of the Salt Lake Gallery Stroll, and we are thrilled with the work that you all, as well as the administration and collective impact are doing to solve the long-term homeless problems um, in the area of Rio Grande. <coughs> However, we are also looking to deal with some of the um, issues that are immediate um, as a result of the May 31st um, work session. We wanted to provide a little input from what we see being on the streets as the gallery stroll and servicing many of the businesses in that area. Um, the biggest concern that we have is that there is not the sufficient threshold of policing to make sure that the actual resources that we're using towards policing is effective. In other words, what we get for lack of foot patrol is, you know, the wonderful bicycle um, police coming around, addressing a specific issue, and then pushing the crime immediately, instantaneously, to an area in the same couple of block radiuses that does not have police presence. So we are also asking for um, a reallocation of funding um, to, you know, or, and long-term new budget funding to make sure that we have this necessary threshold in the form of foot patrol police. Um, this is definitely not to say that we're not interested in addressing the long-term social issues that most of the people down there um, that we see and deal with are um, experiencing, including um, drug addiction as well as um, mental health issues. Time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Houchon, followed by Bernard Hart. Mayor, Council, thank you for having me. Um, I am a person from the university who works with youth experiencing homelessness and I also am the Pioneer Park Coalition Chair for the Subcommittee on 
homeless families and children. Um, what I'd like to do is shift some of the conversation in terms of what you heard, and I'm going to give you a problem statement. I'm going to read it to you. The process, and I'm saying process and practices associated with low barrier sheltering of persons experiencing homelessness in Salt Lake City have had far-reaching, life-threatening, negative effects for children and youth, for our businesses, for private citizens who live in the neighborhood, for tourism, etc. In a four-week period, and I'll talk about businesses right now, in a four-week period, we had Caputo's broken into, MJSA, we had an attack at Bruges, and the Rose Establishment was broken into. The pastry chef was nearly critically injured. She was not. Children and youth are exposed on a regular basis, and this is across class and race, to mind-numbing, brain-changing violence that affects their performance in school. I'm talking again about the process and practices associated with low barrier shelter, sheltering that affect homeless persons and everyone in the neighborhood. So we've been told we need to think of this in a triangulated way, both in terms of protection, generational homelessness, and city vibrancy scores, walkability, tourism, etc. Protection is critical. We need beat officers back on the beat, period. That's a short-term immediate goal. There are medial and long terms. But beat officers back on the beat, we must have immediately, if we think we're going to solve issues of generational homelessness, city vibrancy scores, safety, etc. Beat officers back on the beat. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much. Bernard Hart, followed by Gloria Red Redbear, I believe. Madam Mayor, Council, thank you for uh, listening to us. I struggle when we broaden our approach to a problem and we make the, the, the vision that what we see so broad that we can't do anything about it. And that's labeling something homelessness. We do not have a homeless problem. We may have a lot of people without homes, but they don't have homes because they, for whatever reason, the reasons they don't have homes are mental illness. We have a mental illness problem in this country that's overwhelming, that there isn't anybody, there isn't a solution out there that's available in any community. It just doesn't exist. And if you had that, you would be the, a hero in any, whatever community you lived in. That, that solution for mental, the, the wide range of mental health issues from schizophrenia to bipolar to depression to the veterans that come back with post-traumatic stress disorder, the solutions aren't there. The military hasn't found them. Nobody has found them. And yet you're going to take the people that are around the Rio, Rio Grande area and you're going to move that problem somewhere else without having a solution for the community that you're moving it into. You're just moving the problem around from place to place. So I'm going to suggest that uh, one of the rays of light I've seen is the pay for success program that the county is putting together. I would suggest that the city partner with the, the, the county in some ways to oversee the success programs and to see if there are programs out there that are generating success within this homeless community because besides the welfare and the drugs, you also have the economically disadvantaged. Time. You have a three-piece problem that there is no solution to. If you can find a successful program somewhere before you move the problem into another community, we'll all be better off and it might be a better way to build a, a decision-making process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Gloria Redberry. Aho, hi, Lakota. I'm a Native American. My chief, my great grandfather, is this sitting bull, crazy horse, red cub. 
This mother is crying because I represent the homeless people, the property. What you were doing is you're destroying the education that you have. You need to help the homeless people. You need to help the property because Jesus tried it once, but he's going to give you all the chance too to help us. I, pre I present the, all the homeless. I'm the editor for the homeless people, and I've been talking to the drug dealers. I've been talking to the homeless people. I've been talking to a lot of people there. I help clean the environment there. I talk to people. There is a lot of mental disturbing people. But I'm going to let you know, these are the Americans that you need to help. And help us. If you can help, then I will help them too. You got to remember, it took a Native American to save this world. I am crying because the Mother Nature is not loving it. And the Kowash in the park, that is a cemetery. If we could clean that up, things will be a lot better. My two minutes is going to be less. But you know what? There's a lot of things a lot of people need to be helped. And it's the Americans here today. The education is being abused among us. So please use your education right. I, we are tired of being abused with the education of BA and AA and whatever the education is. Please help us. That's all we ask. That's all we ask and I will help you. I've been talking to the homeless people, the drug dealers. I have been so good to a lot of people there. I come from South Dakota. I come from the Mount Rushmore. I come here to speak for the people, for the homeless and the poverty. Because, you know, they put us here on earth to equal. This is how I live on this world. Because I love each and one of everyone on this earth. Time. And so I expect good, positive things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Redbear. That is all the comment cards that I've received. Does anyone else would like to speak tonight? All right. Thank you all very much for your comments. We are now at the new business uh, portion of our agenda. Item E1 is regarding advice and consent. Mr. Director. Chair. Yes. Uh, I move that we suspend the rules and uh, consent to the appointment of Economic Development Director Lara Fritz. Is there a second? We have a, a motion by uh, Councilmember Luke, a second by Councilmember Kitchen, I believe. Any discussion? All, right, all in favor? Oh, I do. Aye. Aye. I just wanted Wait. to say, even though it's already been done, welcome, Laura. We're really excited. Uh, this has been a long time coming. I mean, this is the second year in a row that economic development has been a priority for the council. And um, just welcome to Salt Lake City, like I said in our meeting one-on-one. -on -one. We'll, we'll welcome you with open arms and, and do whatever we can to help you and be successful. I believe you interrupted the vote, but... I think it went through. We'll allow that. Uh, there's no, uh, motion passes, excuse me. There are no unfinished business items on our agenda. Mr. Chair, I move that we adopt the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion to adopt the consent agenda by Councilmember Penfold, second by Councilmember Rogers. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, I move that we uh, revisit the uh, advice and consent uh, agenda that, or issue that we just did and, and revote. Oh. So I, let me let me do this again. So I, I move that we suspend the rules and consent to the appointment of Economic Development Director Lara Fritz. Second. Can I, just for clarification, do we need to vote on re, re, uh, calling it first? No, I, I just think it was a technical glitch okay. that the vote never actually happened. I think okay. you all thought it had, but okay. let's get the vote on the record. All right. Yeah. It's because it's because I was supposed to welcome you again, Lara. <laughs> We'll blame our chair on so that. So should, should we formally do a vote again here? Yes. Just make sure. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, See, any it opposed? is important that you stay just to ensure that it actually happens. Uh. All right. Any opposed? Thank you. <laughs> Motion passes. Thank you to the chair and vice chair. Um, well, this... This concludes our formal council meeting. Thank you all for your attendance at tonight's meeting. The meeting stands adjourned. Yes. How was it? Good job.